How is everybody? Thank you for being patient. I know I'm a minute or two late, guys. Um, still catching my breath, Ron, on TikTok up until about a minute ago. So, uh, welcome to the weekly live stream. There's 15 of you out there. Everybody say hello so I know who's here. Let me know if you're from TikTok or if you're a regular or whatever. I know Stuart's an old hand. He knows everybody. Uh, he's one of our regulars. Um, but yeah, today we're going to get out some venomous snakes, like always. We've got um, Jake, our Murray Darling carpet python, but we're going to get out Nala, uh, the, the Mulga, the King Brown. We're going to get out a Red Belly, a Tiger Snake, and an Eastern Brown. Um, but first, I wanted to have a bit of a chat about something that's in the media an awful lot lately. lately. Um, and this is Bob Irwin. Is it a bit... You're here tomorrow. It is cold down here tonight, but it's not just any jumper. It's the Wicked Wildlife Jumper. Unfortunately, I think it's backwards on the, the, the camera. But uh, yeah, we, we've now got Wicked Wildlife merch. And I thought, you know what? I better show it off. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've got Wicked Wildlife Jumpers, T-shirts, and we've got mugs and T-shirts with Be Nice to Wildlife. You made it not for long. Best jumper, I think that... Well, yeah, I wanted to buy one myself because I didn't want you to, to tell you guys to buy them if they were crap. Um, but we got one. And I'm in trouble because I didn't buy a second one for my missus because they're pretty comfy. So um, we're going to be buying another one or two uh, in the next week or so. Um, they do take a fair while to ship though because they come from the States. Um, and I imagine there's not many planes going from the States to Australia these days. So it took a couple of weeks to get here. But yeah, Wicked Wildlife merch is now here. So if you want to help us out, guys, buy a jumper. But what we want to talk about before we get out the venomous snakes is, is Bob Irwin. And, and obviously he's been in the media today um, through basically not to do with him he hasn't gone out to the media his family obviously have and for a bunch of things that you can find out about it we don't want to talk about that and the family drama and all that but what i do want to talk about a little bit is what bob Irwin means to to us as wicked wildlife and and how in a way wicked wildlife only exists because of bob Irwin. um you see if, if you work with wildlife and you're i don't know anywhere from 20 to 60 years of age People are going to say, oh, you must have been you know, motivated by Steve Irwin. And like, of course I was. Everybody was. Uh, he was sort of an icon of our generation. Um, and when I was young, I grew up and I watched a lot of Steve Irwin. But as I started wanting to, you know, getting goals of working into the wildlife industry, and I wanted to be more than just a zookeeper. I wanted to I don't know, make a bigger change and talk to people on a broader scale. And that's how we, we, we do on YouTube now. And... Everybody, as soon as you're an Australian especially, um, if you're an Australian especially and you want to talk about wildlife, everybody compares you to Steve Irwin. And after a while, I started to think, you know what? I can't make a difference. Like, Steve Irwin grew up at a zoo. He was catching crocodiles by nine. Um, how, how could I compare to that? Um, so I, through a bunch of reasons, not just that, I had a bunch of you know things going on in my personal life and whatnot. It began to get really disheartened. And I thought, well... I, I'm not cut out to achieve what I want to achieve. And um, we actually gave up Wicked Wildlife. Wicked Wildlife started more than 10 years ago. And for the space of three or four years, uh, I had no animals. And we didn't do anything on our Facebook page rather than, than share some stories from local wildlife carers. Um, and I didn't do a show. I didn't talk to the public, didn't do anything. And it wasn't until I read um, Bob Irwin's biography by Amanda French um, that I, I really learned. Bob Irwin's story and while Steve is obviously a huge influence to anybody who keeps wildlife when I started to read Bob's story it just I don't know, lit a fire in me hey like Bob started Australia Zoo if you you don't know he started as Beaver Reptile Park it became Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park and then Australia Zoo so Steve Irwin everything he was was built by the um the foundation that Bob Irwin laid but that's not why it's so motivational to me. What really inspired me about Bob, and I'm, I'm re, I, anybody who knows me know I don't read very well, um, but I've been listening to his audio book again, starting today with everything that's going on. Um, and if you listen to Bob Irwin's audio book or read the book, if you can sit down long enough to read a book, um, you'll know Bob Irwin was a plumber from Melbourne, actually about 35 minutes from where I grew up, albeit 50 years later. Um, but he was, he was a plumber. He wasn't born on a zoo. He was, didn't have pets as a kid. He just liked animals. And it wasn't until he was 31 years of age 
where you know he started really collecting some reptiles and he decided that he liked reptiles enough they wanted to start a wildlife park. He got sick of his job. So he quit his day job and, and went up there. He didn't catch his first crocodile until his mid to late 30s, but he established and pioneered all the methods that Steve Irwin ended up making famous. So uh, in a weird way, like Steve Irwin, you know, maybe got us motivated as kids, but he was so easy to put on a pedestal. You know, he was a one in a million person. There'll never be another Steve Irwin. But when you read Bob's story and you see all the changes that Bob made in the world and all the amazing conservational things he did, and you think he was a regular guy. He was an amazing regular guy. But it, I started to think, you know what, if, if he can quit his plumbing job in Melbourne and build a zoo, I'm sure we can build a business and teach people and reach a wider audience. So, you know, I I don't know anything about the ins and outs of the relationship in the Owen family. Um, but I, I've got to say, I'm pretty touched by, you know, Bob Owen means a lot to us as a business. Um, and, and our business wouldn't exist if I didn't read the book by Bob Irwin and on his life. It would have just seemed too unachievable to me. So um, even though I've never met Bob and Bob doesn't know who I am, we owe an awful lot to him. Uh, and, and that's what I really wanted to sort of talk about to start off with tonight. But uh, as always, I'll catch up on some questions. Eggleston, Angel, you're here. Hello, how are you? Tamara, <laughs> good. so happy I'm back. I'm glad to be back. To be honest, it's... You know, I've worked a lot of other jobs. I've, I've been a snake catcher. I've worked on several farms. I've shorn sheep. I've picked fruit and whatever. But, um, and I'm not the best keeper. I'm, I'm never, ever going to say. Like, there is, is keepers who breed really technical species, far better keepers than me. But the only thing that I feel really good at is talking to people, um, which is weird. I'm actually quite a, like an introverted person when you meet me in real life. But um, I'm, I'm, the only thing I feel good at is talking to the public. So... Um, mental health wise, it was a real hard few years not doing shows. G'day Carly, how are ya? Shannon, how are you? I hope you're feeling better. Well, starting to come good anyway. Mr. TikTok Jordan, no worries, we'll get out some critters now. I've been drowned in uni work. Oh, I don't, don't envy you at all. We've got lots of regulars here tonight. Do I want to make something like him? Do I think I will achieve? Look, you know, I, I, I'm... I'm not naive enough to think that we're ever going to build Australia Zoo. But I do have, you know, some big ideas. I'd love to do a couple of things. Our first major goal is to build our YouTube channel big enough that we can help out local wildlife care. So I'd love to get a following big enough that we can do what Dingo Dinkleman does on his channel. It's Dingo's birthday today, by the way, guys. So when you hop off this, spam Dingo on, any, on his things and say happy birthday from Wicked Wildlife. But um, uh, so I'd love to build our channel, our first goal, big enough that... We could do what Dingo does. We could have a wildlife carer come and say, look, we need to rescue five kangaroos before they're shot. It's going to cost $2,000 and we can raise $2,000 for them. Or somebody goes, look, we've got an eagle that needs a 30 meter aviary to rehabilitate and learn to fly so we can go back to the wild. We can raise that money to build them their aviary. That's our first goal for this channel. Um, eventually, long term, um, you know, I've talked to my partner a bunch of things and every, everybody wants to build a zoo. But I'd love to build, get to the point where we can buy a nice block of land and build like a like a private zoo, like an Airbnb type thing where you can come, you can stay the night, you can feed the kangaroos and, and you know maybe hold some snakes, get some photos um, and use that as a base to do the wildlife displays that we do. So that's my, um, my long-term goal. I'm a bit of all right, Nick. I'm keeping warm. I am. Uh, it's, it is pretty. I say it's cold, Eccleston. Over there, you probably... I think this is a balmy day, but it's not any jumper tonight. I've got this jumper on because it's the new Wicked Wildlife merchandise, guys. Um, it doesn't look as good on the camera as it does in real life. But, um, yeah, Wicked Wildlife, crocodile print, Australian logo, website on the back. Um, and we've got a couple of different designs. We've got this, the Wicked Wildlife, on a shirt and a jumper. And we've got Be Nice to Wildlife on mugs and on shirts as well. Would 10 out of 10 travel down and do it? Yeah, I'd love to. Um that's our end goal, and the, our dream property for it is for sale at the moment. It's like 120 acres um, in the Grampians National Park. Like, it borders the Grampians National Park, and it's already got a second building on it that's used as an Airbnb. Unfortunately, it's like $2 million. So we need to build our YouTube channel and the business big enough that we can afford 
to do it. <laughs> but one day, that, that's our long-term goal. You know, if we could have people come and it be like more personal, you could bring your, you know, your five kids and they could just come around and, and be a zookeeper for the day and you could go, mum and dad could go to the local spa. Um, $40 million can ruin a family. You'll pull that out of your back pocket? Oh, oh, tomorrow we can be best friends. We're already pretty good friends, aren't we? Um, I'm st I still owe you a dingo photo. Uh, Eccleston, where can you buy the merch? If you go to our YouTube channel, there's all the little tabs at the top. Um, so there's, you know, videos, playlists, community, and one of them is store. Um, and you can just click the one you want on that. It'll take you to the Teespring website where you can pick your color. Um, I got black because I just think if I'm going to do shows in it, the black is the nicest. But to be honest, somebody took sent me a photo the other day. I'll put one up on the community to have a photo of the green one. It's like forest green, like the crocodile tank. And it looks really good. I reckon I'm going to... My, my, my wife wants... I've got to get used to saying wife now. My wife wants one and I reckon I'm going to convince her to get the green one because it looks so good and it means I can steal it. Have to go. Keep up the good note. Thank you for stopping by, Kevin. What snake do I have with me? So this fellow here, this is Jake, our Murray Darling carpet python. So this guy is actually an endangered species here in Victoria. They're still secure in New South Wales and Queensland, South Australia, but in, in Victoria, these guys are listed as an endangered species. So it's a, a fantastic snake to take to schools and birthdays and kindergartens and things like that. So do I want to do like Coyote, educate Australian children about wildlife? Um, yeah, I suppose I already do educate Australian children. Like, you know, the YouTube channel is my passion. It's what I like doing because I can talk to all you guys. Um, but before COVID, every Saturday and Sunday, I was taking my animals on car trips and going and visiting schools and birthday parties and kindergarten. Like, we've already taught tens of thousands of Australian kids about wildlife. That's what we do. But I'd like to build our channel to the point where I can teach millions of kids about wildlife. So that's our goal. Want a green one? You'll have to let me know how the green one looks. The green one looks great. There's um, there's two different colors of green. This is the darker green that this bloke got. The lead beater's possum is endangered. What other endangered fauna have I got? Um, I love lead beater's possums, but they don't really exist in private captive hands. Um, what other endangered stuff do I have? I don't know. I've got... I've got a purebred alpine dingo. They're listed as an endangered species in Victoria. Um, the Cunningham skink is common as mud in Victoria, but endangered in South Australia. So prickle here, our Cunningham skink in, in South Australia is listed as endangered. Um, we're, we're hopefully getting some brush tail bedongs, which were extinct on the mainland. So that, that's one up from endangered. They were extinct everywhere except for an island and or a very small patch in, in Western Australia. Um, and they've been bred up from there. So such a huge skink. Yeah, this is Prickle. Prickle is one of my favorites. Prickle's a very cool lizard. I don't trust them not to eat my ears though. So if you see a, a hungry Cunningham going for my ear, let me know, guys. Great that you have an educational center about wildlife. Think partnering with a zoo or sponsor like Australia Zoo. Unfortunately, you know, it'd be a great idea. Zoos don't like that. Zoo, zoos have their own educational programs. They have their own staff to do it. They don't want to sort of share glory with anybody else. And I get that as well. Like, um, you know, I've had other companies approach me who do what I do, native animal displays, and they don't do venomous snakes. And they're like, oh, could you come and display the venomous snakes at one of our displays? I'm like, yeah, I could probably do that. And they're like, oh, but we want you to not share your business name. We want, we'll pay you and you can do it as us. I'm like, well, no. And it's the same thing with the zoo. You know, they're not going to get me they're going to do it their own way, which is fair enough. There's been a serious uptake of koalas being hit by cars lately. What is up? Are people doing it on purpose? Look, I don't know if people are doing it on purpose. In my area, koalas are hit by, by trucks specifically pretty badly. Uh, he's near my ear. Oh, there he is. Hey, you prickle. He's looking at it. Um, so, yeah, koalas get hit by trucks trucks in my area pretty badly because we've got a lot of we've actually in my area koalas are probably in higher than natural numbers um because we've got a lot of blue gum plantations we, we years and years and years 100 years ago they cleared a bunch of forests um turned it into paddocks koala numbers obviously dropped uh, and then the blue gum industry came in and they planted thousands of acres with just straight blue gum um which isn't very natural 
But if you want to breed koalas, blue gum is like, I don't know, it's like candy canes for koalas. They love blue gum. And uh, in the blue gum plantations, they bred in big numbers. The sad thing is with blue gums, um, they've got to the right size where they're harvesting them. So the koalas are leaving the plantations. They do have to have koala spotters. They have people go in and pick the trees the koalas are in and they have to go around those trees and leave them. But usually, you know, the next day, those koalas realize the rest of the forest has gone. They climb down, they look for somewhere else. They're crossing the roads. And when you add that to the combination, you've got all these trucks carrying a hundred ton of logs, can't stop in time. There's a lot of koalas get hit by trucks in my area, unfortunately. Hey, a prickle. Wasn't here for the start of the show. How has Bob impacted our life? So yeah, Bob, basically in, in it was sort of the inspiration to restart Wicked Wildlife. Um, we stopped doing shows for several years um, for, for a whole heap of reasons. And it was reading Bob's book. The fact that I sort of relate him to Steve, where people say, oh, you must be motivated by Steve. And Steve was fantastic, but he was so not a normal person. He was born at a zoo and he was catching crocodiles as a, a nine-year-old and caught brown snakes when he was four. And it's so easy to look at him and go, well, I could never do that. Whereas Bob's story, when you start to read it, he was just a guy that liked animals. He was a plumber with no no wildlife experience until he caught a tiger snake when he was fishing one day and he really liked it. So he, he got, read all the books he could and he went and got another snake and another snake. And um, yeah, so that's how you know Bob started. Uh, in his 30s, he decided he liked reptiles enough and he was sick of plumbing. He was just going to buy a block of land and build a zoo. So Bob, Bob's story, Steve was a fantastic educator, but Bob is an inspiration, if that makes sense. So, yeah. I love koalas. I love koalas too. I was never the biggest koala fan. I'm, I'm horrified to admit. Never the biggest koala fan as a kid. Um, well, as a, a young adult. Because, oh, thank you very much, Kyle. Um... Help with some feed. Well, I've actually got to refill our wombat food bin in the next week or two. So that'll go a long way towards it. Buy a bag of kangaroo pellets or something. Thank you very much. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So, so when I started, you know, as a wildlife keeper at zoos, I liked koalas, but I wasn't. I was actually a koala keeper. And at first, I was like, oh, man, I'm the koala keeper. And it sounds weird. But the reason being was I sort of felt like of all the animals in Australia, koalas are one that, are so easy to get people to like that, you know, look, we need to conserve koalas, but we also need to conserve all the other animals in the forest and nobody cares about them. They just care about the koalas. So koalas sort of, um, I don't know, I thought, oh, everybody wants to do koalas. But when I started to work more with koalas, for a start, I realised they're amazing, but also realised how they're important even as a flagship species. I can't get people to plant 10,000 trees to protect brush-tailed fasca gales, but I can get them to plant trees to help koalas and the brush-tailed fasca gales can live there. Yeah, birds, so on, all the small stuff lives, you know, is just as important, but it's harder to get people excited about. Do I think that forest destruction affects a lot of forest wildlife? It certainly does. You know, like forest destruction is, is a big thing. Sadly, you know, as bad as deforestation is, um, it's only one issue. Like deforestation, you know, we'll talk about feral animals. I'll get a venomous snake out in a minute. But uh, when we talk about feral cats, a whole heap of well-meaning people say, oh, well, you know, it's not the cat's fault and deforestation's the big issue. I'm like, well, yeah, deforestation's a huge issue. But the more we remove forests, the more important it becomes to make sure that the remaining forests are as healthy as possible. And that includes not having cats. The other thing with deforestation is people think of rainforests and stuff getting cut down. And obviously that's terrible. But our most endangered environment in Australia is grasslands. Uh, in Victoria, less than 1% of native grasslands still exist. Less than 1%. And it's because grasslands are easiest to turn into paddocks. So the first thing, the first habitat we destroyed was grasslands. So grassland species are some of the most impacted uh, animals in Australia. But same thing, they're all little. They're not big. I Iconic animals. Forest fires are a big problem to Australia. They certainly are. Ever handled one before? I've not handled a brush-tailed fasca gale. I've handled a, another fasca gale species, but I can't remember. It was caught in a trap by accident in Queensland. I had to release it, but 
I'll try and figure out what Fascagal it was that I have handled. Maybe it was an antikinus. It was an antikinus. Like, we call it a yellow-footed antikinus. It has to be possible for humans and animals to live in harmony without going to extremes. Look, it is. Um, it's gonna, it all depends on what one person calls an extreme and another person doesn't. We'll get out of snake while we're chatting, guys, because I can't expect you all to hang around for nothing. You say you hang around to listen to me, but you really hang around to see some animals. Um, so the snake we're going to get out first is Rami, our tiger snake. Hey, you Rami. Um, so yeah, deforestation is obviously a big issue, but it's not just you know forests. People think of you know the rainforest and stuff, but um, yeah, grasslands and stuff like that are just as bad. As far as people living with wildlife, there's a few I don't know ways to go about it. Like one sort of argument or idea is that people should live in smaller and smaller houses so that we take up less space. And then, you know, they can be where the people live and they can be where the wildlife live, which I disagree. I understand the idea because if you have it that way, you're going to have less, you know, kangaroos hit by cars and stuff like this. The sad reality is um, I think a better solution, and it's going to involve some conflict, um, is to find ways for people and animals to live alongside each other. So, you know, more native plants in backyards and nest boxes in backyards and keeping your cats indoors and... Um, Planning out, you know, planning out ways that native animals can either live in our suburbs or at least get through our suburbs to get from one natural area to another natural area. That's the most viable solution, in my opinion, because it, it avoids the island effect where animals become inbred in, uh, uh, you know, if we have one national park and then 200 kilometers of suburbs and then another national park, they might as well be different countries. The animals in those parks can't breed with the animals in the next park. So they become inbred um, and, you know, we face all sorts of issues. Or if a fire goes through there, you know, fires have been in Australia for tens of thousands of years. What's changed? Well, Spitfire's better, Rami. <laughs> yeah, Rami, Rami behaves a bit better than Spitfire lately. I don't blame Spitfire. He's a bit big to sit on a hook. But um, So, yeah, you know, fires have been a big part in Australia for thousands of years. Why is it so bad now? Well, this whole climate change issue as well. But a big thing that's different with... Um, fires today versus 100, 200 years ago, thousands of years ago, is fires used to roar through, they'd miss patches, and then animals could move back into the burnt country. But today, our forests are so disconnected that if you have, you know, a forest burned down from one end to the other, and, you know, it's surrounded by cities and suburbs, animals can't move back in. You know, everything dies there and animals can't move back into that area. So... Uh, you know, fire dynamics are very different today than they were a few hundred years ago. We can't repopulate. So for that reason, I think the the model of, of people living alongside animals is better. The downside of it is, is you're also going to have conflicts. You know, it's inevitable that you're going to have things hit by cars. You're going to have, you know, people's dogs get the possum on the back fence. Um, but it sort of becomes a, a necessary sacrifice to have animals living in the suburbs. I'll put this guy away because it's hard for me to read the comments while I'm playing with the venomous snake, even though Rami's being such a good boy today. I would be handling Rami with a new hook, but um, the real Rami hasn't got one, got one to me yet. Got to disappear. No worries. Thank you very much for dropping by, Kyle. Uh, are there animals falling from the trees because of hot weather, fainting on the ground, such cases? No, so, so the heat itself doesn't seem to affect most animals like that. Um, there's a few different opinions. Oh, thank you very much, Jane. It means a lot. If you are going to leave a super chat, guys, you know, we really appreciate it. But if you are, leave a question or ask us to, to get something out or give me some way to repay you. It's the least I can do. Um, but yeah, climate change in Australia has a few potential things. Get a brown, get a brown. Don't make me feel bad, Nick. <laughs> uh, I don't have to make you feel bad. Tamara's going to start ganging up on you, I think. Um... So yeah, a few ways that climate change can affect animals. Um, reptiles can be affected because, a few ways. So a lot of our alpine reptiles, as it gets warmer, if it gets warmer in the lowlands, you know, like in the, the, up the east coast, animals can move further south. But if you live on a mountain and it gets warmer, you can't move further up the mountain once you run out of mountain. So animals in the high country, and even animals in the tropics, things like Boyd's forest dragons, who, um, see you tomorrow, thanks for dropping by. You'll get my hooks or you'll get my hooks sorted. Um, tomorrow's my usually my clock watcher for me. Um, so yeah, 
uh, climate change is affecting species like that, where they can't move further up the mountain, they'll run out of mountain. Um, the other things that can be affected by climate change, we're noticing in some other countries, and it could happen in Australia, is things like turtles, um, whose the sex that they hatch out at is based on temperature that they're incubated at. And there's beaches in Central and South America where they're all hatching female. No male turtles are being born because of the temperature change. So, um, you know, the temperature can, can affect it that way. Um, koalas are being affected by climate change because as it gets drier, there's less moisture content in the leaves. So they're not getting enough water from the leaves to survive. They're coming down to drink more often. Uh, and that puts you in a conflict with cars and dogs. So, you know, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of follow-on effects from all those. Ever had Boyd's Forest Dragons? I, I'd have kept Boyd's Forest Dragons. Um, I probably won't get them back just because they look amazing, but they don't do very good for shows. They're not something that you'd take out and show people, you know, every weekend. What are my thoughts on big cats, big cats like jaguars living in the high country? Personally, I don't think they're there um, for a few reasons. So, you know, everybody talks about... They never, you're the first person to say jaguars. Everybody says panthers. It's always panthers. And I have to explain to people, there is no such species as a panther. You have a black leopard, you have a black jaguar, you can call them a panther, but a panther is just a black type of those animals. Um, so everybody sees black ones and they never see regular colored ones. Um, but no, I don't believe they exist. Um, a lot of people see them. I've got good friends who think that they've seen them. But I've also got friends who have seen ghosts, the Virgin Mary, aliens. Um, so human eyewitness accounts count for very, very little. Ye years ago, I'll get this brown stuff out in a second. Years ago, I, I went to a house that they rang me and they saw a four foot purple and orange snake. And I raced out thinking, oh my God, it's going to be some illegally smuggled corn snake morph. It's going to be something exciting. And I get there and I start tearing apart their shed and there is crap everywhere in the shed. You know, I move 300 kilos of stuff out of the shed. And every time I ask, how big was it? It gets a little smaller, a little smaller, a little smaller. And at the bottom of the shed, the far back wall, after I've moved everything they own out of the shed, I catch this little marbled gecko. It's like, yeah, that's it. So I went, this accounts are, are tricky. Um, I don't believe they exist, not just because of eyewitness accounts. So the brown set we're going to take out today is Rover. Rowdy's younger brother. I say that, they're not related. He's just smaller. So this is Rover. Maybe I'll sit him down and I'll move it around so you can see me. G'day, Carleem. How are you, mate? I hope I said your name right. You'll have to excuse me while I readjust this, guys. I'm going to put the brown snake on the ground. Once you leave, be able to see him. I'm gonna stand this side so you don't disappear under my tape. So, um, yeah, I don't believe the Panthers exist for a few reasons. For a start, eyewitness accounts don't count for much. On top of that, um, you know, things like clouded leopards and Sumatran rhinos and things where there's, you know, like less than 10 in a country. Scientists are still able to track down an encounter, yet we've got enough of these big cats in a built up country like Australia that. We don't get any real evidence of them. It just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, on top of that, if all the stories about them getting here all involve them being things like mascots or circus animals, zoo animals, basically all humanized animals, which means, you know, yeah, we would be 20 generations removed by now, but the very original animals would not have been hard to track down, hunt, shoot, then come into towns looking for food because all the original stories involve them being handled, humanized animals from captive situations. They would have had no fear of people. Yeah, I don't believe the big cats are out in Australia. I've got a friend who swears black and blue that the big cat story is a, a remaining population. And, and again, this isn't my belief, but he swears black and blue that the, the big cat story, people are actually seeing marsupial lions that haven't gone extinct yet. So, who knows? So... This is Rover. Rover is one of our eastern brown snakes. Uh, you guys who watch all the time, you'll know we've got Rover, um, who probably comes out a little bit less often. And we've got Rowdy, how bigger of the two. Rowdy 
Rowdy is very, very deep in shed, so we'll leave him alone. He's cranky enough on a good day, Rowdy. Um, Rover's not much better, but he's being good today. I reckon just in the last two months, since we started doing live streams, my snakes have calmed down just because they're getting hauled out for you guys every week. So it's probably been a good thing for them. Um, but yeah, so this is the Eastern Brown Snake, which is the second most venomous snake in the world. Leading cause of snake bite death in Australia. Um, if you put the brown, the Eastern Brown, uh, together with the Western Brown, the Northern Brown, the Dew Guy, so the whole brown snake family, you're going to account for almost every snake bite in Australia. You know, tigers, tiger bands, that is, they account for very few bites compared to the brown and very, very few deaths. Most of the deaths are going to be brown snakes as well. Um, so, yeah. He's a pretty serious snake. And so, the phone camera's just a little bit too small to... There you go. I have to screenshot that bit. Get a photo. Good fun. We'll tackle some questions and then uh, we'll maybe get out somebody else for a while. Very different. <laughs> yeah, so Rover is a better temperament than Rowdy. Um, but he's still, he's still pretty rowdy. He's just a little bit smaller, so he can't come quite quite back as on as Has he got an eye cap on him? I have to have a closer look. Like, obviously, he's got the regular eye scales that cover him. Um he did shed not too long ago, so I haven't noticed a retained eye cap. He might have one there. Will I do breeding conservation programs for bilbies or numbats? I'd love to do breeding conservation programs for bilbies and numbats. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as just getting them and breeding them. Um, you know, like most bilbies in captivity aren't suitable for breed for release programs because they don't belong to a stud book where you know which other bilbies in Australian zoos are related to. So firstly, you've got to, it's usually accredited zoos. You've got to be affiliated with a stud book program. Uh, so probably not those species. Uh, I am hoping to get a pair of curlews. They're, well, they actually already belong to me. They're just at another zoo um, waiting for permits and stuff to come through for a pair of bushstone curlews, which are a cool bird. Um, and they're endangered in, in Victoria. Foxes have almost eradicated them. Um, and these two curlews that I'm getting, they are part of a stud book. So their babies are eligible to be released into parts of New South Wales where uh, they've been wiped out. So we will hopefully breed them. And um, the other animal that we're hoping to get, um, if we can organise an enclosure and get it built and paid for in time, will be brush tail betongs, um, which unfortunately these brush tails aren't going to be suitable for release. But... Um, there's still a whole heap of benefits to breeding them. Like, we, we can breed them, we can play around with different methods. The good thing about private people, we can play around with husbandry techniques that zoos can't because they've got to follow the rules. And uh, if something works, we can write that in a paper and we can publish it and then zoos can copy it once they know it works. On top of that, you know, we, we can use them. Well, these brush tail bedongs are going to... We're hoping to breed them and use them for, um, like, educational displays. So we're going to hand raise some of their babies and things like that. Flipped a baby brown over to day under a big rock. Next to the bush, lifted up. Couldn't see anything, lifted up again. Fell a dart back towards the rocks. Yeah, the, the snakes are well and truly gone to bed down here. It was negative one degrees this morning. You finally found a brown around me. Go to bed tomorrow. <laughs> you don't don't have to go to bed. You can stay up and watch as long as you like. But um, I know you've got an early day tomorrow. I've noticed the scrubby doesn't seem to strike as much as he did. Yeah, he's definitely getting better. Um... Oh, thank you very much, Alex. Would it be possible for a brown snake and a taipan to breed together as in a crossbreed? Good question. No. <laughs> so uh, we've got a video somewhere on can different snakes crossbreed. And usually when they're talking about different snakes, it's old timers saying, oh, you know, you still got to kill all the carpet pythons because they're breeding with brown snakes and you could have a python that's actually a little bit venomous. Um, so pythons and venomous snakes can't breed. But within venomous snakes themselves, um, you know, they're still very, very diverse as a group. Um, so type ends, brown snakes can't crossbreed. But species within a genus um, could technically crossbreed. So um, I saw a photo the other day of a Papuan type end 
well, a snake that was half Papuan type band, half coastal type band. Mind you, they're both subspecies. Um, it would, in theory, I haven't seen any, but it would be in theory possible to crossbreed probably collets and spotted blacks. Like they're genetically very similar. Um, so, you, you know, you could probably crossbreed an eastern brown and a western brown. But no, browns and taipans, two, you know, there's several million years between them probably. Um, so, yeah. Found a carpet python on the road. I wish I could find carpet pythons on the road. I've seen photos of collets and spotted blacks crossed. I've seen photos that you get some spotted blacks with very high orange as well. So I don't know whether, when can we see the wombat and what is a number? Um, I'll try and do some videos with the wombat. Um, she's probably going to be a bit hard to use on a live stream for now because it's winter. So it's dark at like six o'clock. Um, but once it gets light and we get the Wi-Fi and stuff sorted out, we might do a live stream in the wombat pen, you know, down the track in, in summer. You don't get me outside in winter out here. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try and show you the wombat, but I'll do some regular videos. I've got a bunch of little topics that we might do our shorts, our 60 second videos on the wombat while I'm waiting to get into South Australia to do your koala videos for you, Eccleston. Um, South Australia's just opened their border up again. I've just now, now, because it got delayed and our sheep are giving birth, we're lambing. So I can't really be more than an hour away from the property uh, for the next sort of seven or eight weeks because twice a day I have to go around and check four and a half thousand sheep, make sure they're all okay. So once that's done, we'll get back into South Australia and we'll do some koala videos and wombat videos. Um, but what's a numbat? A numbat is another marsupial. It's sort of a, it looks a bit like an anteater. Like it's got a long skinny nose. Um, halfway between a mongoose and an anteater. It's got a funny bushy tail, um, long skinny nose, and they eat termites. They live in Western Australia. They're really interesting because because they eat termites, lamb picks or it doesn't happen. I can give you lamb picks tomorrow. Don't worry about that. They'll, um, yeah. The next time we have a barbecue, you can have some lamb picks. So yeah, the number it looks halfway between a mongoose and a, an anteater. But what's really interesting about them is most, the vast majority, 90% of marsupials are nocturnal or crepuscular. They come out at night. But numbats, they come out during the day and they sleep at night. And the reason being is because they eat termites. Termites are exothermic or cold blood. So at night they dig deep underground to dig for the deep for the numbat to dig. When it warms up, the termites are working just below the surface. Uh, which is where the numbat can dig them up. So the numbat has to be awake during the day because his food is awake during the day. Which is the same reason echidnas are usually found during the day, not at night time. We don't get no pythons in Sierra, only casual browns and tigers. Yeah, no, no pythons. You, you don't have to go too far north from, from Horsham, Warwick, to be able to get pythons. There's pythons in, um, like, Hattacolkine area, but they're pretty pretty rare there. But there is pythons up Hattacolkine, a few hours north of you. When I get down there, they better be having lamb, mate. I, I eat more lamb than anybody you've ever met. How many snakes do I own? <laughs> I don't know. It might be, these days it might be 30, 40. We'll say 35-ish. I don't count them. And I say this all the time. I don't count them because if I count them and my partner asks how many I have, I have to give her a number. Whereas by not counting them, I get to say, oh, I don't know, love. Don't know. It's safer. So, well, uh, we've got a few things out. We'll get Nala out, maybe, a Molga. We got her out on TikTok. So she's already been man out once today. All right, this is Nala, a beautiful King Brown snake, or Molga snake. I know anybody who's really into reptiles probably like cringes when they hear me use the word King Brown because Mulga is a far better name than King Brown because they're not a brown snake. They're, well, they're a brown colored snake, but they're not in the brown snake family. Uh, they're in the black snake family. I use the word King Brown basically out of bad habit. <laughs> uh, I deal almost exclusively with farmers. And, and if I say Mulga to them, they don't know what I'm talking about. So uh, I've just gotten in the habit of using King Brown for the people I'm talking with. But uh, Mulga is better. It bugs you when I say King Brown. <laughs> you guys are smart enough to know what I'm talking about. And if I, 
<laughs> if I use the word mulga, I still have to use the word king brown because as soon as I say mulga, I have to say the mulga, which you would know is the king brown. Um, so it's easy to say king... Basically, I end up just doing it the other way around. I'm like, this is the king brown, but it's better to call it the mulga. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, it goes both ways. At the end of the day, um, you know, not all tiger snakes are striped, not all brown snakes are brown, so King Brown's not that much, uh, not that much worse than every other snake name in Australia, really. But Nala's taming down very, very well. Um, she still has her moments, but I don't know if you guys remember the first day we got her out of her tub when she came from Queensland. She was pretty wild. She wanted to disappear under the, the crocodile tank beside me. Um, now she just, yeah, she, she's, she's getting very easily. She's taking it all in her stride. Um, and she's doing all right. You remember that last year when she went off? Yes. Yeah, she, she, I let her out of the tub. I put her down. I reckon I looked up to answer a question. She poof, straight under there. I just hope she gets really big. I know she's a girl, so she might not get too much bigger than this. But man, I would love to have like a, a big two meter plus. If she got to two meters, that'd be fantastic. But I've seen photos of three meter Kananara King Browns. And man, they look the closest thing you'll get in Australia to keeping a king cobra. They're amazing. You're a good girl. Give everybody a kiss before you go back. <laughs> All right, we'll pop her away. We'll tackle some more questions. And we've got one more venomous snake for the night before I call it a night, guys. So, for anybody else who, who hasn't already, you know, you hopped on more recently, Wicked Wildlife merch is now here. Jumpers, t-shirts, check it out, best way you can help the channel. Um, besides Patreon supporters and all that, have I ever had you, you guys? I've never had you guys. I, I was almost scammed on a Jew guy, I think. <laughs> Somebody rang me wanting to sell me a Jew guy. And, um, like, I was going to pay first, because you have to pay first when getting anything. It just it didn't sound right. And um, I started asking for photos and stuff, and he just stopped responding. So whether he got sick of somebody saying, you know, I want, thought I was just a photo collector wasting his time, or whether he was actually trying to rip me off and sell me a snake that didn't exist, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I, I almost kind of got a Jew guide at one point in time, but I've never kept any. Have you think about doing videos on mountain pygmy possums, lots, tree kangaroos, yellow belly, ooh, yellow belly gliders, greater gliders, platypus, lace monitors, and Australian giant monitor, Parenti? Um, I'd love to do videos on all of those. I've got a video planned on the mountain pygmy possum. Um, Gumbaya Fauna Park on the other side of Melbourne. They breed them and they've said that I can come and film them there. Um, but the best time to do it sort of like August. Like we want to do it while they're hibernating so I can hold it and be like, how cute is this? Um, lace monitors. We do have a lace monitor, but, um, I'm waiting to go to Lilydale High School again and film because they've got a big one called Mr. Lacey. Um, so I'll do that. And I've got a, a contact with a parenti who can uh, help me with a video, but he's in Sydney. I've got a tree kangaroo hospital in Cairns. If we can raise the money to get to Cairns, she said we can come and film her tree kangaroos. Um, so yeah, we, I, I'm happy to do videos on anything if we can get the animal, like access to the animal. Really want to see mountain pygmy possums. Hope you can get them in captivity. Is there a difference with wild and captivity and longevity? Um, they used to be very short-lived in captivity, um, but they seem to be getting longer, and the trick seems to be uh, people didn't hibernate them properly. Night, Alex. Thank you for tuning in. G'day, Sydney. Sorry I missed the first 30 minutes. No, don't be sorry at all. Thank you for dropping by. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I haven't kept mountain pygmy possums or worked with them, but the people I know who have worked with them have said since they started hibernating them, they've started living longer. Mountain mammals in Australia hibernate as well as reptiles and frogs. So yeah, hibernation's a tricky thing. Reptile keepers usually love tearing people to shreds when people use the word hibernation. And they say reptiles don't hibernate, they brumate. Um, and brumation, up until 20 years ago, was just called hibernation. Um, officially, the difference between brumation and hibernation, um, bears hibernate. So like, if, if you have a warm day, in the middle of winter, the bear stays asleep. Hibernation is based on time. Brumation, which is what reptiles do, if you have a warm day in the middle of winter, they'll wake up, they'll get a drink, they might look and see if there's a better site to sleep in. 
So it's sort of like a, a half-assed hibernation. Um, and there's also some, some physiological differences. Uh, brumating animals, I think it's brumating animals lower their oxygen intake and one doesn't. It got up to 30 degrees. Is that 30 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what 30 degrees Fahrenheit even is. In layman's terms, yeah. So like hibernation is perfectly... Every other reptile person will get grumpy about this. Hibernation is perfectly acceptable, in my opinion, to describe brumating animals. What about legless lizards? Uh, I've done a legless lizard video, but I've got Lilydale High School, and we can get back there. They keep a few legless lizards. I don't want to. I've always said from the beginning, we're not going to be one of those channels that just gets animals to do videos on. If if I'm offered an animal and it's something I actually want and I have a use for it as you know an educational animal, I'll I'll take it if I've got room for it. Um, but we're not going to get animals just to talk about them on film. I'd much rather find people that own them. I can go there, film there, and not have the responsibility of feeding an extra animal, um, especially while we're waiting for COVID. 30 Fahrenheit is negative one degree. I hope you're talking 30 degrees Celsius, Eccleston. Putting it in my temperatures, nine degrees Fahrenheit, yeah. 30 degrees Celsius sounds a lot better than negative one. I was complaining because it was negative one degrees yesterday morning. My boss just about had to kick me to get me going at work. No one's going to get upset here with me. I oh, know, we're in a safe place here. Uh, do you think about more native frogs? I'd love to get some more native frogs. Um, I'm not, not going to get heaps. The reality is the, there's, the sad thing about running a business is it gets to a point where you can't get animals just because you want them. Like, I've had a lot of animals that I personally like, um, but when I'm trying to do it for a living, I can't, you know, justify getting them just because I want them. So, you know, there's like 50 really cool species of frogs that I'd love to have. Uh, we keep two species at the moment. We keep Perrin's tree frogs, which uh, they're gonna, they're indoors at the moment, but they're gonna move outdoors. Um, and I keep magnificent tree frogs, which uh, they've got an indoor enclosure. We're gonna basically work towards just having one species indoors. We'll keep magnificent tree frogs. Uh, maybe if I get white-lipped tree frogs in the same size, they can live with them. You can keep the species together as long as the individual's are the same size but I want one frog tank inside. I don't want too many. Um, but outdoors, I'd like to get a couple of species. I'd like to have banjo frogs because they get big and they're good because they're local to my area. Um, so banjos, growling grass frogs. I actually sold my bell frogs to make room for growling grass frogs. Um, banjos, growling grass frogs, and our parents' tree frogs will be the only three species I'm really planning to keep um, outside. So four species of frog. Minus one died temp like that in Australia. Yeah, yeah, we, we had a negative one degree morning yesterday. Have I ever had banjo frogs and growling frogs? Um, I've looked after growling grass frogs, but I've never owned them myself, but I've got a friend who breeds them. So um, we're hoping to get some off him uh, maybe next season, this summer. Um, banjo frogs, I've kept lots of banjo frogs in the past. They're really cool. Uh, I just don't have any now. So we're gonna get banjo frogs again. And I like them because they're local species. So the banjo frogs I want because they're local, they're hardy, so and they're good, you know, to show kids. The the growling grass frogs um, I want because for a start they're endangered in Victoria, and they're found in my area. What are they kept in outdoors? So currently uh, I don't have any frogs outdoors, but I used to keep my bell frogs outdoors in like um, an IBC container. You know, like the, the white IBCs, cut to about knee height um, with screen over most of it in perspex, like corrugated iron laser light over half. And I've got it in an area that's sort of under a bit sort of wedged in among some trees so that it doesn't get frosty and stuff in there. And um, my bell frogs did fine there. Um, obviously you'd only do it with frogs from our local area. What was the locations of pythons in Victoria? Uh, had a colchine. It would be the closest place to you that I know of uh, Murray Darlings being found. You would hate New York and get negative 40. Yeah, it's crazy. All I can think about is cool runnings. <laughs> you know, like he walks out, he's Sanka, what you smoking? I'm not smoking, I breathe it. Well, I'm cold now and it's like eight degrees. I need to be back in North Queensland. So who have we got out? We've got out, we got out the brown snake, we got out Nala, we got out Rami, 
Brutus. Would you like to see Brutus, the red belly black snake? We'll get out one more snake and, uh, geez, we've been here 50 minutes. I was going to say maybe it'll be a quick one tonight, but <laughs> we've been here 50 minutes already. We'll get out uh, Brutus, the red belly black, and um, start to wrap things up, I think. My poor other half, she complains she doesn't see me every Tuesday night. I say, it's work related, honey. And now I say, well, there's people waiting on me. I have to. This is Brutus. This is one everybody knows. Brutus, I should get Brutus t-shirts made up. <laughs> everybody loves Brutus. Um, and, and how can you not love him? He's a pretty cool snake. Minus 40. Yeah, bugger minus 40. Never a quick one, and we don't mind either. I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad you guys don't mind listening to me. We managed to drag it out for a while every time. Hey, Brutus. Brutus would wave back, but he got no arms. See my surgeon on Monday. Book in for oh, oh, uh, Then he'll need to book in an OR for me. I hope you, you get good news from your surgeon, and, and I hope all the other procedures. Eccleston's got, yeah, some, some health sort of things going on, and, and she's been, yeah, kind enough to support us despite everything she's got going on, so... We all wish you well, Eccleston. Love the look of the colouring red bellies. Yeah, everybody loves the red bellies. And the thing with Brutus, if I'm going to get a shirt made up with Brutus, I almost feel like it's got to be Brutus, not just any red belly, because everybody seems to recognise Brutus has that scar on his side. Every video that I do with Brutus, people are like, oh, he's got a scar. So if I just got a photo of a red belly and whacked it on a shirt, you'll all know. Um, so, yeah, I've... I've got to track down maybe a good artist and she can do a picture of Brutus. Brutus is one of my favourite snakes of yours. Brutus is probably one of my favourite snakes too. He's, I don't want to say he's relaxing to handle. He's still a, a very venomous snake. But it's just nice to handle a snake that he sits well. He doesn't, you know, he's just an inoffensive snake to deal with. Surgeon's going to move your thyroid. Complicated surgery. Oh, I hope it all goes well. My mother had... um. Uh, another gland in her brain, uh, a hormonal gland removed, and she's had health problems for, for years. So, what's the scar from? We don't know. <laughs> Our TikTok videos, there's like 800 comments being like, where do you get the scar? We really don't know. He, he came to me with the scar already. Um, so, and, and he came to me from somebody who had permits to collect a few wild snakes. Um, and I only know that some of these snakes were wild because he's got records of them going back to where they were caught from. But Brutus's records don't go back that far. Um, it doesn't say where he was purchased from either. But um, he told me that he got Brutus from another demonstrator. Um, but this fellow was, you know, getting on a bit. Um, so who who knows? It could be that he was a wild caught snake one day. It could be that he was captive and um, he was fed live rats and he got a bite to the side. Could be a bunch of things. But yeah, he's had that scar um, for as long as we've had him. So, But he's a good boy. Of all the snakes I've got, he's probably the best one to do last when I'm getting tired. Hey, you Brutus. Good boy. All right, we've done four venomous snakes tonight, guys. Was Brutus from Kirk? Yeah, he was. So I got Brutus from Kirk very early on, and um, basically straight off the bat. And then uh, they got onto me and said, would you like the rest of them? So I, I took on a lot of the other animals. So, well, a few of the other animals. The brown snakes come from Kirk. Um, Spitfire comes from Kirk. And Brutus comes from Kirk. And the blue bellies. I got two blue bellies. I got... Um, the blue belly that you see in shows, and I've got another blue belly who, I don't know, he almost needs to be put down. Like, Kirk basically said, do you want this this other one for free? Like, he's, he's very old, uh, he eats very sporadically, and he's, he's, he still eats from time to time, but he's got no muscle definition left. He just feels like a sock. Um, but while he eats and while he, but we don't bother handling him much. I just, we let him live out his days. Have I heard of scaly foots? I have heard of scaly foots. I've... I used to keep Eastern Hooded Scaly Foot, um, and I was lucky enough to catch a Brigolo Scaly Foot, which is an endangered species when I worked in Queensland, so it was pretty cool. Um, what are my opinions on the controversial Snake Man? I'm not gonna say too much about the Snake Man, other than um, 
when we stopped doing the demonstrations, I said at the beginning of this live stream, we stopped doing the demonstrations years ago. I just, I lost the motivation to do it. The, I was sick of the industry. And a big part of it was because of bullying by the snake man. So, um, yeah. We'll leave it at that because I don't want to end up in court. I think those type ends are still for sale. Really? I might have to hit him up after we lost ours. Mind you, yeah, I've got to afford it as well. Like, the problem is, because I'm in a regional area, and because Kirk's in a regional area, um, getting them from one regional area to another regional area cost me a fortune. Um, I think I spent more on freight than I did on the animals. Thanks for the time. Appreciate your great work. Stay safe. Thank you for coming by, Stuart. You were the first one here, too. Sammy Angels, yeah, all the best to Eccleston. That's right, we all, we all want to pass on our good regards to Eccleston. All right, guys, uh, we might wrap things up there. We, we might get out in less than an hour. It's 55, 56 minutes. But before we do, I know it's boring, but we wrap up the same way every time. There's a few things you can do um, if you want to help us out. Uh, of course, we, we appreciate everybody who, who's given us super chats and all that. It goes a long way to keeping the lights on the animals fed. But um, if you want to do more, there's a few of you guys already, a few, fair few of you guys today, who are our amazing Patreon supporters. Um, you know, patreon.com forward slash Wicked Wildlife. Um, you can support us there for a monthly amount. And depending on what you do, you can uh, get your name in the credits of our videos. We've got a private Facebook group, um, which I'd like to get more active. But it means you've got any, all our patrons have, have access to me to ask me questions. From time to time, they get to vote on video topics. Uh, but I'd really like to get build a real community in there. And uh, if I can find out a way with Teespring to give discounts on our merch and stuff, we will. Um, but yeah, our Patreon supporters mean a lot. And the other one is, of course, if you want to... Oh, thank you very much, Davili. Um, You're a legend. Um, but yeah, if you want to, guys, Wicked Wildlife jumpers, T-shirts, and uh, be nice to wildlife mugs. I did buy a mug as well, which I'm hoping gets here for next week because... This Monday is my birthday. So I'm, and currently Australia Post reckons my mug, my Be Nice to Wildlife, Wicked Wildlife mug, is gonna arrive on my birthday. Would have thought they'd ship them both at the same time, rather than ship two parcels from America. But um, yeah, so hopefully it gets here for next week, which is my birthday. So the, the live stream next week will be, happy birthday in advance, thank you. Well, you can, <laughs> the next week's live stream will be the day after my birthday. So, I might still be a be digesting cake. We'll wait and see. See you next week. Thank you, guys. Happy birthday. Thank you, everybody. All right. So, yeah, we've said that. Patreon, merchandise. Um, but the biggest thing, guys, and it costs you nothing, is sh show us some blue tongues. All right. I'll show you some blue tongues, Kylie, before we go. Your birthday's the 29th. The 28th is my birthday, which is Monday. I think it's Monday. <laughs> You've got me questioning my birthday now. I'll show you one blue tongue before, uh, I'll show you two lizards before we go. I'll reach the second tape. Two lizards before we wrap up. We've got our, our alpine blotch blue tongue and a randall, the pink tongue skink. So, very close, well, fairly closely related. So the pink tongue skink is what we call in the slender blue tongue family, which is cyclotomorphous, whereas all the true blue tongues are in Taliqua. So, yeah, closely related, but different uh, different genuses. Yeah, Monday is the 28th. Thank you, Sammy. I was starting to doubt my own birthday. Always wanted a pink tongue. So have I. I've never had one. I've looked after them. But I, I got a phone call the other week by a lady who, whose partner had moved out and left her with this pink tongue skink. And... Uh, she didn't know what to do with it. So she said, do you want it? All, all right. So just had to give her kids some photo opportunities with some snakes in exchange. It was fantastic. Slender blue tongue. Never knew it before. Yeah, there's a few slender blue tongue species, but the pink tongue skink, ironically, is a slender blue tongue skink. There's a difference in size. Yeah, so she, she's about the length of a blue tongue lizard. She, he, we don't really know. But he's much more sort of fine. So these guys are semi-arboreal, they climb, whereas blue tongues can't climb to save themselves. So they're much more fine, delicate lizard. 
are both against Tingston by the tongue, I think. Yeah, so pink tongue skinks do have, obviously, you're not going to show us. Do have a pink tongue. There you go. Do have a little pink tongue. When they're born, they've got blue tongues. Uh, and all the rest of the slender blue tongue family have um, blue tongues as well. So the pink tongue's the only slender blue tongue with a pink tongue. But uh, oh, we pushed over an hour, guys. <laughs> they could be pets. Yeah, they, they make they make good pets. Um, blue tongues make the best pets just because they're so easy. Pink tongues aren't much worse. Um, they just need a slightly taller tank. And they're a little bit feisty to feed. They're basically snail and slug specialist. So, yeah. I go through a lot of snails. All right, guys. Like I could say now, I feel bad I can't say no to anybody who wants to see an animal. You guys are all kind enough to, um, you know, hop on here and help help me out and, and watch our videos and all that. So the least I can do is give you some bang for your buck, guys. I don't have mountain dragons. We can't keep mountain dragons in Victoria. I'd love them. Love from Denmark. G'day in Australia. How are you? All right, guys, we're going to wrap things up there. We're going to head off. Um, we've been here an hour. Um, I want to get inside before my other half thinks I've forgotten she exists. Um, but we will be back here next week, guys. Um, yeah, get out. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. Uh, in between now and next week, guys, as always, be nice to wildlife. Have a good one. Take care. See you soon.